and Jesus is really the center of the message that we have to share with you this afternoon. And I want to read a few scattered readings. First one we're going to read is an Old Testament part of the Bible. It's Isaiah, a well-known part of the Bible, Isaiah chapter 53. We'll just read verse 5. Uh, we're going to read the following of that. It says these words. This is Isaiah, right in words. Uh, prophetically about the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation, for he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And I just want to thank for predominantly this afternoon, that first little statement in, uh, in verse 5, it says, he was wounded. He was wounded. And that takes us back to Good Friday. That takes us back to the crucifixion. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, was wounded. We'll turn over into the New Testament and we're looking at 1 Corinthians. Dad's already quoted this verse as well. Just the kind of gospel message almost in a nutshell. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. Paul's writing and he says, I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And a little statement that I want to pick out of that little uh, section of the Bible this afternoon is that he was buried. He was buried. So in Isaiah chapter 53, he was wounded. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he was buried. Matthew chapter 28. Dad's already made, made reference to this as well in the message that he shared with the kids. Matthew chapter 28. We'll just read from verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat in it. And his countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that ye seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. In Matthew chapter 28, it's this little statement in verse 6. He is risen. And then finally, in John's Gospel, in chapter 14, another well-known uh, section of the Bible, these were words that the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking in preparation for Easter weekend. These were words that were spoken as the Lord Jesus Christ spent some time in the upper room with his disciples, uh, in a sense preparing them for what was to come. He says in verse 1 of chapter 14 in John, Let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and where I go you know, and the way you know. And the little thing I want to think in that little section of the Bible is this, he will come, he will come. That's my little message for you this afternoon, four little statements that we can uh, set our thoughts around about for the next few minutes this afternoon. He was wounded. He was wounded, reminds us of Good Friday, reminds us of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes and he says, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ died. But then it says, he was buried. He was buried. And I suppose there's a sense in which as we think of that Holy Saturday, that day when the Lord Jesus Christ lay in the tomb, but he was buried. And then in Matthew chapter 28, those words from the angels concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, he is risen. And that's Easter Sunday, that's the message for today. He's alive. 
and then just to conclude our message, the uh, Lord Jesus Christ said to his own disciples that he was going. See, none of Easter Sunday took the Lord Jesus Christ by surprise. The crucifixion didn't sneak up in Jesus. Uh, as if he never knew what was going to take place, he came fully prepared for the cross. He came fully prepared to suffer and to die. He, he came fully prepared to know that he would enter any death. Uh, and that he would spend those hours in death and that he would rise from the dead. It was all known to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said these words. He says, I'm going. He says, but I will come again. And he will come. He will come. And the reality is this this afternoon, we don't know when that's going to be. And God's reminded us already of the purpose for which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come for his own. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come for those who have placed their faith and trust in him. For those who have experienced the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. We wait with anticipation for the day when he will come. I wonder this afternoon, are you ready? Are you ready for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back again? If the Lord Jesus Christ is coming for people who have put their faith and trust in him. If the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back for people whose sins are forgiven and who are cleansed. I wonder are you waiting, ready for that? But I wonder if the Lord Jesus Christ was to come back. I wonder if this afternoon you would be left behind and you would be left behind for God's judgment. He will come. <laughs> it's a solemn thought at the beginning of our little service this afternoon. Are you ready for that? You know, we're thinking this afternoon, we're thinking, uh, thinking back, aren't we? As we're thinking back to Easter, that first Easter. And we're thinking back to the crucifixion. And we're thinking back to the burial. And we're thinking back to the resurrection. But there are some in the room this afternoon, and we're looking forward. We're looking forward to the day when the Lord Jesus Christ will come back again and where we'll be taken to be with him and be with him forever and forever and forever. And the question to you this afternoon at the commencement of our little message is this, are you ready for him to come back? Have you been made right with God? Are your sins forgiven? Are your sins cleansed? Or this afternoon are you still, are you still out with the salvation that God has for you. So we think back, think back to Easter, think back to the crucifixion, we think back to these words recorded by Isaiah the prophet, he was wounded, he was wounded for our transgression. So interestingly, Isaiah is recording these words 700, perhaps 740 years before the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. Is that not just a miracle in itself? Does that not just give you encouragement that the book from which we read this afternoon, the book in which we base our beliefs, is a book that can have things written 700 years in advance to those events taking place? You think about that this afternoon. If I was to say something today, or write something down today, and predict what was going to happen 700 years from now, in 2723, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? And yet Isaiah records these words 740 years before the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is going to experience crucifixion, before the wounded servant that we're reading of this afternoon is even going to come into this world. Isaiah writes concerning him. And Isaiah wrote those words without knowing what he was writing, without understanding the words that he was scribbling down in his parchment with his pen, words that he had no understanding of. And yet God inspired them by the Holy Spirit to write them. That's just one of many prophecies in the Old Testament that pointed forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. Prophecies about his birth, prophecies about his life, prophecies about his death, prophecies about his second coming. It's all there. Because it's a book that has been written by the hand of God. Who has used men as instruments in his hand. But nonetheless, it's a book that has come and inspired by God himself. A God that we can trust. If God can come good on a promise that he made a man write 740 years before the events happened, is that not a God in whom we can place our trust this afternoon? It's not sad, isn't it, that there are so few, there are so few that we can really depend on. Him. There are so few that we can really rely on. 
I know you're here this afternoon, and maybe you're going through your mind thinking of people that you can depend on today. People that you can trust in. Maybe think of people that you thought you could depend on, and, and sadly, they've let you down in one way or another. And maybe you're here this afternoon, and you've got trust issues, and maybe those trust issues are, are, are real. You know, I want to say to you this afternoon, God is a God in whom we can place our trust. God is a God in whom we can rely. God is a God who is absolutely dependable. And things that God has recorded for us centuries in advance come to fruition because he is a God who is in control. And he's a God that we can trust. That's amazing this afternoon. That God is a God who is dependable. God is a God in whom you can trust this afternoon. When he gets Isaiah 700 years before, pray these words, he was wounded. About the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a vivid description of the events of Calvary that are going to take place. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we appeal. You see, history can give us the events that surrounded the life and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. History books can tell us that Jesus was here. History books can tell us that Jesus died. History books can tell us where he died. History books can tell us uh, how he died. The Bible tells us why he died. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Every wrongdoing that you've ever performed this afternoon, regardless of your age, that's why Christ was wounded. He was wounded for them. Our sins require punishment. Our sins are, are, are too big to just be uh, just to be brushed aside as if they're irrelevant, as if they don't matter. Sin you need to be dealt with. Sin you need to be punished. And, and, and God has an option as to whether he punishes you for the wrong that you've committed or he punishes someone on your behalf. And the suffering servant that we've read of in Isaiah chapter 53 is the one that came to suffer in your part. He was wounded for your transgression. He was bruised for your iniquity. The chastisement of your peace was upon him. And with his stripes this afternoon, you can be healed. Be healed through what the Lord Jesus Christ has done on the cross. The suffering Savior was suffering for you. It was your sin. It was my sin. It was the sins of this entire world that, that were laid on the shoulders of the Lord Jesus Christ as he suffered on our cross. I wonder is it the reality of that ever been? I wonder do you read those words, listen to those words. You know, I was just struck with my dead brother Molly. He was wounded. He was wounded. And we don't even give it a second thought. And we don't allow the truth of those words to really grip our hearts. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And it was all our wrongdoing that led to him. Scripture, we remember the encounter that Nicodemus would have had 
with the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 3. He comes to the Lord Jesus Christ at night for some reason, a religious man, a religious leader, a rabbi. And he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ with questions, and, and there's a bit of a, a dialogue between the Lord Jesus Christ and Nicodemus, and, and then we don't really know much of the outcome of that. And it's during that discourse, isn't it, that we read those wonderful words by the Lord Jesus Christ. It says these words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Words that have been preached down through the centuries. Words that have been used by God to bring people to, to his Son as their Saviour. Words that were perhaps used to bring Nicodemus to himself. We don't read about them much in between times. And then we come to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We think of the brutality of men as they crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. And we contrast that with the kind hands that we take him down from the cross. And who did those kind hands belong to? They belong to Nicodemus. And they belong to Joseph of Arimathea. You know, really, I suppose there's a sense in which they were secret disciples, don't they? Who knows when Nicodemus gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Who knows if it was during that initial consultation that he had with the Lord Jesus Christ at night that he became a follower. But here at this point, he was going to nail his colours to the mask, wasn't he? He was going to identify himself with the Lord Jesus Christ. A man that the crowd had just shouted out, away with him. Away with him, we don't want him. Nicodemus comes forth. Nicodemus associates himself with the Lord Jesus Christ. It must have been the most difficult point to associate yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ when everybody else was sweating around him. And Nicodemus is going to identify himself with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I wonder this afternoon, have you ever identified yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, maybe you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ this afternoon. Maybe there's been a point in the past that you've listened to the, the message as you've heard God speak, that you've responded to that message, that your heart's been opened, that you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if you've ever taken that step of, of, of identifying yourself with him publicly. As, more, as, as Nicodemus and, and Joseph of Arimathea would have stand as they were, shoulder to shoulder with Christ, showing their devotion to Christ, realising that nothing else mattered. Nothing else mattered for these men than securing the body of Christ and giving them a proper burial. Christ is at the very forefront of their life. You know, I challenge my heart this afternoon, I challenge the heart of everyone in this room. Those of us who are Christians and those of us who have never become Christians, at what value do we place on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we willing to devote everything to Him? Are we willing to stand as we are this afternoon, shoulder to shoulder with Jesus Christ, and declare to everyone that we're followers of Him, that our allegiance lies in Jesus, and follow after Him? That's where that was the demand Jesus placed on His disciples. <laughs> he says, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. This was an act of self denial for Joseph and for Nicodemus. Who knew the repercussions they could have faced for siding with Jesus and taking his body from the tree and burying it in the tomb? Who knew the effect that would have on them? Who knew the effect it would have on their relationships? Who knew the effect it would have on them as far as their social standards was concerned? Who knew the effect it would have on them as far as their religious uh, respectability was concerned that they were willing to lay it all aside and follow after them? Jesus, and I challenge our hearts today, this afternoon, to be willing to be like Nicodemus, to be willing to be like Joseph, and to be willing to nail our colours to the mass and fall after him who was buried, who was buried. Then he stayed buried. You know, I think that must have been a long, long day, or a long, long set of hours for those disciples that had placed their, their trust in Jesus. I think that must have been the darkest day in their experience. Men that had left everything. Men that had heard the call as they came out this afternoon, follow me. They've done that. They've followed them. Some of them had left everything. They'd left families. They'd left businesses. They'd left financial security. They'd left homes. They'd left parents. They'd left it all behind. And they'd placed all their hope in that man. And they'd stood. Some of them at a distance. Maybe some of them not even within the vicinity because they couldn't find them still to be there. But they certainly knew that they would be out and doomed to die and they placed all their hopes in them. And they felt so, I can imagine, so, so hopeless. And maybe even there was a little thought in their mind that 
that none of the crying around about the cross concerning Jesus, save yourself, save yourself, if you're really the Christ, save yourself, and maybe even in the hearts of the disciples, that same crying is like a This is the time to prove who you are. This is the time to demonstrate to the world that you're the Son of God. This is the time to demonstrate to the world that you're the Messiah. Save yourself. And maybe even up to those moments before the Lord Jesus Christ was very dead and dead, there was hope within the best of those disciples that he was going to do something wonderful. He was going to do something miraculous. Despite the fact Jesus had told them from the very outset of his public ministry that he was going to suffer and die. They didn't want to accept it. They didn't want to believe it. And maybe even if he's hanging on the cross, they're still thinking, they're still hope. It's almost that little saying, isn't it? Where there's life, there's hope. And maybe that's just their thoughts concerning Jesus. While he's still alive, there's an opportunity that he's going to do something miraculous here. He's going to liberate himself from the cross. He's going to annihilate his enemies. He's going to set up his kingdom. And then Christ dies. And we see that lifeless body get taken from the grave, from the cross, and we see it get laid in the grave. And our hopes are absolutely crushed. I wonder, does that speak in our hearts this afternoon? Hopes are crushed. This feeling is as if, as if, what's the point? You've given up so much. You, you've done everything you were asked to do, as these men have done. And your hopes have been crushed. Well, praise God this afternoon that he was going to do something miraculous. He was going to do something wonderful. He was going to do something that was going to restore the hope. He was going to do something that was going to restore the lives. Because we read one way in Matthew chapter 28, he is not here, he is risen. He is risen. You know, Jesus was going to go a step further than just hanging on the cross. Jesus was going to enter into death. And Jesus was going to go into the grave and he was going to lie there. And then he was going to defeat death. And he was going to defeat hell. And he was going to defeat the grave. And he's alive. And he's alive forevermore this afternoon. He is risen. That's what Easter's all about this afternoon. The fact that we serve, that we preach, that we worship a living Saviour. Somebody that's alive and he's alive forevermore. And if, if God is a God that we can trust because he can write things 700 in advance, uh, years in advance of them happening, is Christ not a Saviour that we can trust that has conquered death, hell and the grave when he's alive? That's someone with power this afternoon. That's someone with authority. That is someone with might. And God already reminded us that death is the thing that we feel the most things in. And if I like to work, I see it perhaps more often than the rest of you. As we see the fear in people's faces, as they're struck with the reality that death is real and their death is imminent. Isn't it great this afternoon that we can preach a Savior that's alive? That has defeated death. Paul could very quickly say, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your sting? He is risen. He's alive this afternoon. And if he can defeat death, then it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter what obstacle you're experiencing at this particular moment in time. It doesn't matter what issue you're facing. He's more than enough. He's more than sufficient for it. The one that has the ability to defeat death is the one who has the ability to do anything in your life. The ability to transform it. To break to break an addiction that's holding on to you, that's ruined your life up to this very point. God has the ability to break into your life and liberate you from that. The sin that you just keep going back to time and time and time again, He's got the ability to come in and He's got the ability to liberate you from that. There's not an obstacle this afternoon that you is not able, able to deal with. The one that can defeat death. And hell and the grave, and the one that can take the sting out of it is the one that can offer so much to you <coughs> this afternoon. He's worthy of your trust this afternoon. This is a saviour this afternoon that's worth trusting. The one who was wounded, wounded for you, wounded for me. The one who was buried, the one who was really dead, the one who lay in the tomb, the one who's alive, 
the one who is raised, the one who is back in heaven this afternoon, once he was raised from the grave, you know, he spent that time with us, and then he ascended back up into heaven, and he sat with his father in heaven now, and he's awaiting the day. He's awaiting the day that we read of in John chapter 14, when he says, I will come again. I will come again. And we'll go back to where we started a little message this afternoon, and I'll ask you the question, are you ready? Are you ready for him to come? Have you put your faith and trust in him? Have you acknowledged that he is a saviour that is worth trusting? Anyone that can defeat that can defeat death, anyone who has the ability to stand in your place and be wounded in your place and take the sin that you've committed and, and bear it on his own body, is worthy of your trust. If you trust him this afternoon, then you can rest in the absolute hope that, that when he comes, you will be with him. And it's not just a hope as in, you know, hope that's going to happen. It's an absolute certainty. And just as God, because things 700 years in advance of them happening, and they come to fruition, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I will go, and he says, I will come again. And God, the Lord Jesus Christ is making a promise that he cannot go back on. The Lord Jesus Christ is making a promise in which he cannot reach back. He is one who can be held accountable for the promises that he makes. And he says, I'm going. I'm going to go to Easter Sunday. Good Friday, whatever you call it, whatever you want to call it, Good Friday, go on Saturday, and Easter Sunday, I'm going to go through all that, I'm going to go into death. I'm going to defeat death. Then I'm going to go back to my father, and he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he says, if I prepare a place for you, he says, then I'm coming back to you. But here I am, where you can be. Oh, so what hope? See, the resurrection is not just about hope for life. No, Christianity gives you a better life now. Believe you me. But Christianity gives you far, far more than that. Christianity gives you a hope of future. Gives you a hope of heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so remember this afternoon. Remember these little statements. He will go. <coughs> Just ponder that this afternoon. And remember that that was for you. He was wounded. And remember that he was buried. He really did die. And remember that he is risen. And remember this this afternoon. He will come. He will come. And he will come. Father, we come into your presence and we just thank you for your worship. Thank you for a saviour worth sharing. We thank you for one in whom we can place our trust. And you know every part of the room this afternoon. You know all the problems, you know all the trials, you know all the issues. But Father, we thank you that we can trust you. We thank you that we can depend on you. We thank you that the one that we preach is one who is able to conquer death and hell and grave. That grace of all enemies has been defeated. We bless you for that. We remember the prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ at the very beginning of our Bible was reminded that he would crush the heel of the serpent and in doing so no heel would be hard to us. We just thank you that the enemy has been defeated. Mm-hmm. All the people in the room this afternoon would experience that. Knowing that, that salvation has been secured in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we just thank you for these little statements that we've considered together this afternoon. We pray that your word would um, enter into our hearts, every one of our hearts. We just pray that you would use it to speak into our lives. Some of us Christians, Father, some of us Christians struggling <coughs> with one thing or another. Some of us not even Christians at all yet, Father. We just pray that today that there might just be work done by your Spirit in the lives of every single one of us today. We ask these things.